Please stand and hear our call to worship. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. Let us go to him in prayer now. Our great God and Father, we again come and assemble as your people before your throne, humbly but boldly to proclaim your praises and to sing of your greatness. We ask that you would be with us. We ask that you would encourage us and guide us by your word and spirit into your truth for your glory so that we might more perfectly know and love you and share your goodness and truth with others. Help us to cast aside the concerns of this world this day uh, so that we might focus upon our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. 735 for the glory of Patri. worship our God by singing hymn 635, How Good It Is to Thank the Lord, 635. from Colossians chapter 3. 
Colossians chapter 3, beginning in verse 5, the law, God's instruction given to us so the sinner might know his need of a Savior for us so that we might know how to live before our God. Colossians 3, beginning in verse 5, let us pay heed to this word of our Lord. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Thus for the reading, please be seated. We turn to a time of confession of our sin privately to the Lord. I will finish with a corporate confession. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do come confessing our sin before you. We think as we have read that within ourselves we know that we have not put away anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from our mouth. We haven't put to death the impurity and the immorality and the covetousness, the desires and passions for the things of this world as we ought. We ask your forgiveness. We ask that you would forgive each of the sins confessed here. We ask that you would continue to search our hearts. Help us to know and see our sin against you that we might confess it, that you might make us clean, that you might continue to work in ridding us of these filthy rags that we would present as our own righteousness. Help us, Lord, to die more and more unto our sin and to live more and more unto righteousness by your word and spirit for the sake of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. And for those that have repented and believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ and confessed your sin, I offer you this assurance of pardon of that sin where when we read, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. Amen. Take your Psalters, turn to Psalm 32c. We will praise God for this by singing What Blessedness for Him, Psalm 32c.
Stand with me for the reading of God's word, if you are able, beginning in Isaiah, as we continue in the book of Isaiah, chapter 58. Isaiah 58, let us pay heed to this inerrant, infallible, holy word of God. Cry aloud, do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet, declare to my people their transgression, to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways, as if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the judgment of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments, they delight to draw near to God. Why have we fasted and you see it not? Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure and depress all your workers. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose, a day for a person to humble himself? Is it to bow down his head like a reed and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast and a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I choose, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house, when you see the naked to cover him, and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? Then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger, and speaking wickedness, if you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom be as the noonday. And the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places and make your bones strong and you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail and your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. If you turn back your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight and the holy day of the Lord honorable, if you honor it, not going your own ways, or seeking your own pleasure, or talking idly, then you shall take delight in the Lord. And I will make you ride on the heights of the earth. I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father, for the mouth 
of the Lord has spoken. Thus for the reading of Isaiah 58, turn with me to Mark, the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, according to Mark, the first chapter, as we begin in this gospel for our reading. And again, let us pay careful attention to this holy word of God given to us. Mark chapter 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens opening and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. The spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness forty days, being tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel." Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat, mending the nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice came out of him. And they were all amazed so that they questioned among themselves saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. And immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever, and immediately they told him about her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons. And the whole city was gathered together at the door, and he healed many who were sick with various diseases, and cast out many demons." and would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him, and they found him and said to him, Everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, Let us go on to the next towns, that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons, And a leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling, said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. 
And immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once and said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go. Show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. But he went out and began to talk freely about it and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but was out in desolate places and people were coming to him from every quarter. Thus for the reading from the gospel of Mark. We have heard the word of God. Take your Heidelberg Catechism. Turn to page 10. We will confess together what it is that we believe this morning from Lord's Day number 10, questions 27 and 28. Question, what dost thou mean by the providence of God? Answer, the almighty and everywhere present power of God, whereby, as it were by his hand, he upholds and governs heaven, earth, and all creatures, so that herbs and grass, rain and drought, fruitful and barren years, meat and drink, health and sickness, riches and poverty, Yea, and all things come, not by chance, but by his fatherly hand. Question, what advantage is it to us to know that God has created and by his providence doth still uphold all things? Answer, that we may be patient in adversity, thankful in prosperity, and that in all things which may hereafter befall us, We place our firm trust in our faithful God and Father that nothing shall separate us from his love since all creatures are so in his hand that without his will they cannot so much as move. Thus for the reading, please be seated. Let us pray. Father, in our adoration today, we lift our gaze to you and lift our hearts to you. We lift up our eyes to the hill from where does our help come? Our help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. When our gaze is low, we are filled with doubts and questions. When our gaze is lifted up, heart is lifted up also. We need to behold God. Father, our time of worship together reminds us that our hope is not fixed on anything less than you, our sovereign God. Father, there's a tendency in all of us to forget our neediness. Like the psalmist, we question where our help comes from and must be continually reminded of the source of our hope. We are easily distracted We are lured lured to sleep by idols of comfort and self-sufficiency. We are prone to forget that Christ is the sure and steady anchor in the fury of every storm. And so, Father, we're thankful as we gather to worship you, to set our eyes upon Christ. And so we do that today. We adore you and honor you and thank you for your mercy. And Father, we thank you for the hearing of the gospel in the songs and in the sermons that helps to clear the haze of sin from our eyes and focuses our hearts on you, our glorious God. Father, we ask that you would help us as we continue our corporate worship to be renewed in our hope in you, O God. So we do that today. 
Father, as we now focus on Thanksgiving, help us as we come to you with thankful hearts to know that in spite of our sinfulness, you called each of us out of our darkness into your life. We're thankful for this place where we can come to worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, I'm thankful for each of those that have come today to be in this place and gather to keep this Sabbath day and to focus on you. Father, we are thankful for the children that have come, for those who have families, and for those especially who are gathered here with us today that are able to be gathered here with us. We're thankful for those parents who see the importance for their children, their disciples, to be here in this place of worship. Again, Father, we're thankful for your continuing to sustain each of us through difficult health conditions, some with serious chronic conditions and difficulties, others not so much but still with the aches and pains of life. We're thankful, Father, that our brother, brother Tom is doing better and that, Father, we pray and hope that in a few days he will be released from the hospital and able to come home. We're thankful for the clear proclamation of the gospel that will be brought forth this Lord's Day from our brother Todd as he stands in the pulpit, faithfully doing what he's been called to do, to preach your word in season and out of season. We pray that it will reach the hearts of each of us, your elect, to admonish and encourage us to move forward in our sanctification and to be and use as means of bringing the wandering sheep into your fold. Father, in our time of supplication, we come to you with different needs. We pray for those in our knowledge who face difficult issues with disease, cancer, and other diseases. And as we do each Lord's Day, Father, we lift up to you Bonnie and Melvin Bernhardt, we pray for them. We lift up George and Elsie Briscoe and Elsie Hoff. These individuals who within their hearts would desire to be with us, but for reasons of health and conditions cannot be with us. So we lift them up to you. Father, we pray for others that are having difficulty today. We have many in our fellowship, Lord, that are sick. We pray for Kim Manning and for Anna, her daughter, who is not feeling well. We pray, pray for Kim's sister and the upcoming knee surgery that she will have. We pray for the Westfall children that are sick today. And we pray for others, for Reagan and Evelyn as well, and for the Donnans, for all of these, Lord, that for whatever reason, Father, they were unable to be with us because of illness. So we lift them up to you today. We pray for each of their circumstances that would cause them to know that regardless of health status, Lord, that you are part of this process and that you stand with us each day, helping us to face the circumstances of life. Father, we pray for the spreading of the gospel around this nation. We pray for those organizations that stand faithful for the churches in this area with faithful pastors that preach the gospel. We pray for those that suffer in different parts of this world, especially, Father, we pray for those in the Ukraine that face the difficulties of war and occupation by a foreign nation. We ask that you would pr protect them during these difficult circumstances of their life and that you would cause them to look to you and to trust you. We pray also, Lord, for those in authority over us. We pray against those in government and in, our, and in our nation that would desire to see the message of the gospel totally shut down and to be replaced by secular humanism. We pray for those who face ridicule and persecution as they are faithful to identify as your children. Even as we have read this week, Father, of the little children in school that talk about Jesus and are mocked and made fun of 
by their classmates, and yes, even their teachers. Help them, Lord, to stand strong, strong, knowing that, that their Savior is there to help them, and that as they are faithful to stand before you, that you will remember that and be with them and strengthen them. Your word gives us these admonitions from John chapter 15. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of this world, but I have chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word which I said to you, a slave is no greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. And then again from 1 Timothy, where it says, First of all, then, I urge that the entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men, for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. We desire all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there's one God and one mediator, and also between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all. The testimony given at the proper time. And so, Father, we stand in a world that may hate us, but we know that you love us and have called us to be your faithful servants in the face of all circumstances, good or difficult. And so, Lord, we come before you today. We lift our faithful pastor up, Father, as he will stand before us in a few moments to preach your word. Help him, Father. Help us to listen, to have open minds and open hearts, and to be obedient to what we hear. Again, Father, we thank you and we praise you. And we come to you this day saying the prayer that our Lord taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. seated, take your hymnals, turn to hymn 441. We will prepare our hearts for this message by singing Jesus Shall Reign, hymn 441.
Amen. Turn with me to Psalm 145. Uh, we return to Ezekiel next Lord's Day in the morning. Uh, this morning, uh, Elder K. Boston will be uh, preaching this evening. So come back to hear him on covering disobedience. I'm not sure if that's his own or others. We'll find out this evening. Uh, but this morning, we uh, are continuing, as we do in the evenings, we brought it into the morning. Uh, through the Lord's Days of the Heidelberg Catechism. Uh, I want to read three passages. There's about 12 I'd like to read. Maybe we'll get to some of them as we go along. Let us begin with Psalm 145, beginning in verse 8. Let us pay heed to this word of our God. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power, to make known to the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words and kind in all his works. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand, you satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. The Lord preserves all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. Thus, for the reading from Psalm 145, turn with me to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, beginning in verse 22. We will read about seven verses here. Again, let us pay attention to this word of our God. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God in the hope that they might feel their way toward him and find him. Yet, he is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Thus, for the reading from Acts, one final reading from Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6 beginning in verse 25. And again, I call upon you to pay careful attention to this word of God. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? 
Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Thus, for the reading, for the word of God, let us pray. Merciful Father, we come asking that you would help us to see the truth that you have for us today of your fatherly love, your providential care for your people. Help us to understand it more clearly than we have in the past so that we might live lives fully trusting in what you are doing not just for us, but for your own glory, for the sake of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. So last week, again, we saw God as our Father. Uh, As we are looking at the Heidelberg Catechism each week, we have entered into uh, this grace section of the Catechism. If you remember We said the catechism can be divided into three sections of guilt, grace, and gratitude. We have seen our guilt previously, the state of sin and misery that mankind has entered into in the fall. We have begun the grace, uh, which is what God himself has done and what he is doing so that his people can have eternal union and communion with him. God in the person of Christ has come. And he has lived the life that we could not live, the sinless, perfect life, died the death that we deserve because of our sin as the propitiation, the substitute for our sin, and then repenting of our sinful nature and any attempt to save ourselves, believing on Christ, on God, having a true faith for our salvation is how we receive this gift of salvation. And then the Heidelberg Catechism directs us to the fact that we know this and we continue to know more, if you will, uh, not by creating our own God that we believe in, but there are articles of our Catholic or our universal, that means universal, there are articles of our Catholic universal faith that are necessary, the Catechism says, for a Christian to believe. That's from answer or I want to step further from answer 22, that is from answer 22, and I've asked you to look at these articles uh, as these things, these uh, from the Apostles' Creed, as promises. They are promises. Um, as we think about the things that are necessary to believe, we should not look at them as things we learn, like multiplication tables, so that we have um, some facts provided about how the world operates or how God operates, we need to look at these articles as the promise of the gospel. It is not just that God is our father. Check, I know and understand that. It's not just that he's the almighty maker of heaven and earth. Check, I understand. It is that he is our father. Those describe our father, as I said last week. And in Christ, He is your heavenly father and he is determined according to his gracious and loving will, not just to make you, not just to create you, but to make you his adopted child in Christ. And this week, the promise extends further because we see that as our father, God has not just made us, he has not just made us his adopted children in Christ, but he also tells us then Our Father provides for us with all the things necessary for our body and soul. Those words are found in the answer to question 26. 
But now in uh, the answers to question 27 and 28, we move on to look at how our Father cares for us. And this is divided neatly into new, to two major points for us this morning. One, simply what is providence? And secondly, what good or advantage is it for me to know what providence is? And as we begin, I want to say two things uh, in relation to this message. One, we are responsible for our actions, for our sin. Um, that is not the emphasis here. So I might not say that as much or put it in correlation as much as we would like, but do not think from our discussion of providence and what God is doing in this world that we are then not responsible for our sin. We are. And then secondly, as I said similarly last week, there are more technical, logical, theological arguments we could make for a definition of providence, and we will do some of that. But what I want us to do is focus on the hope that we have, the hope that we have in our God because he is a providential God. He is caring for us. And that should be what we look for when we think of the providence of God. So what is providence? The Heidelberg Catechism states in shorthand, you should have it in front of you or you can have it readily in front of you, that providence is the almighty and everywhere present power of God whereby he upholds and governs heaven, earth, and all creatures so that all things come not by chance but by his fatherly hand. The Westminster Shorter Catechism states that God's works of providence are his most holy, wise, and powerful, preserving and governing all his creatures and all their actions. And then the Westminster Confession of Faith and the larger catechism say something very similar to that, but then they add to or for his own glory. He does these things for his glory. We'll return to that theme shortly. What does the Bible say? In Psalm 145, which we read, verses 8 through 20, we see the psalmist declare these very things. It says, the Lord is gracious and merciful. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. All his saints shall bless him. But how does that happen? Verse 14, again, Psalm 145, verse 14 and following. It says, the Lord upholds, the Lord raises up, the Lord sees, the Lord gives food in season. The Lord opens his hand and satisfies the desires of every living thing. The Lord fulfills the desires of those who fear him and he hears them and he saves them. The Lord preserves those who love him and he will destroy the wicked. All of that from Psalm 145. In other words, the Lord upholds, directs, disposes, and governs all creatures, actions, and things from the greatest to the least, as the Westminster Confession of Faith states it. Acts 17, which we read, gives an even more direct statement in one verse when Paul states to the men of Athens that God himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And then Paul goes on to state that from one man, God made every nation of mankind and has determined the allotted periods and boundaries of their dwelling places. And then even further, Paul states why God has made these nations and why uh, these determined periods and boundaries have been allotted. If you're not there, I would turn to Acts 17. Why does God do this? Why is he providentially doing these things? Paul writes, it is so that these nations and their shifting time periods and their shifting boundaries will cause men to seek God. And then he states, when the true fact remains that God is not far from each of us, but God does these things so that we will seek him. I'm getting ahead of myself. This is really point two, but we can consider this message from Acts 17 uh, with what we have going on in the world today. We have a potentially 
shifting period and a shifting boundary with the nations of Russia and the Ukraine before us. There was a time not so long ago that the older of us remember when the Ukraine and Russia were simply parts of the Soviet Union. And then the USSR, as we knew it, collapsed and we had what were territories uh, that became their own nations. And before the Soviet Union, there had been other political entities and boundaries and struggles. But now today, the leaders in Russia possibly seek to move the border a little more westward, or perhaps they want to subsume the Ukraine in its entirety into their nation. I do not have the ability, nor do you, nor does anyone else, to know exactly what is on the minds of the Russian leaders. But we do know something of what is on the mind of God on this matter. God uses the, the, these things, this what's happening in the Ukraine and Russia, to cause men to seek him. And while it is a great tragedy and an evil for men to war against each other without cause, there is a certain peace that we can have in the fact that in this fallen world, God is at work that we know that our Father is using even this, especially this, as we read in Acts 17, to bring his people to himself. Two months ago, people in the Ukraine, in Kiev, uh, in Russia, and even in America, were potentially sitting at home thinking about some unknown God that they didn't really know. They believed in a God like they believed in the weather forecast. Maybe it will be sunny tomorrow. Maybe it will rain. Who knows? I'll take an umbrella. Maybe there's some great God out there. Maybe there's not. I'll give some lip service to believing in God just in case. I have a Bible on my shelf. There's my spiritual umbrella that I'll run to if I need to, just in case. And then, not so long ago, one nation moves against another nation. Russia moves against the Ukraine, and I cannot be so complacent about this unknown God anymore. But the truth is, God was never far from any of them, from any of us, from each of us. But God is gracious as we sit there lost and he shakes up the world so that we will seek him. God upholds, God sustains, God governs his creation as a good God will uphold and sustain and as a good God governs so that we, his people, will seek him even through what we consider to be horrible tragedies. That is something of the application of our understanding providence. providence. But let's get back on track to a definition of providence. The truth we are looking to is not only that God our Father has created, but that, that he also upholds and governs his creation. What we are arguing is that God did not just create and then let things play themselves out. God did not just wind up a clock and then watch it tick according to some pre-assigned algorithms, God is actively working in creation right now. That is what providence is or does. God is working in this creation because of his son. I don't know if we think about this often enough, but it is in Christ in whom we live and move and have our being and God has created to glorify himself. God has created and brought creation into existence, not for you primarily, not for me primarily, but for his son. He does that through the son. What I am saying is that God created and all of creation exists because it is pointing to Christ. It is pointing to the work of Christ and his incarnation. Christ did not come because of you. You are here 
because of Christ. All that has happened, all that is ever going to happen, finds its purpose and its meaning in glorifying the person and work of Jesus Christ. You are incidental to the glory of Christ. You are not primary. Christ is primary. Noah's existence and obedience, Abraham, David on the throne, Caesar, Augustus, Pontius Pilate, Judas Iscariot, and you all exist due to God's providence and the purpose, not of you, but the purpose of glorifying God in Christ. Again, we do not exist for something in ourselves, for some great reason and purpose within ourselves, but it is to glorify God in Christ. So providence first and foremost is about Christ and what we are doing to serve the purpose of glorifying him, not serving you. But that is a secondary purpose. Romans 1 tells us that providence also serves the purpose of making us witnesses to God's goodness and judgment to the world. Because of the work that God does in us for the sake of Christ, man is inexcusable for not knowing God because God makes himself known through his creation and through his people. And God does not just create, he also preserves. Matthew chapter six, verses 25 through 34, which we read, reminds us of our relationship to God. Our relationship is one or should be one of comfort and rest in Christ. If we understand providence that God upholds and governs all his creatures uh, to maintain their needs, then we can see he will do the same for us. We do not need to be anxious. Our problem has never been our needs. Our problem is always our wants and our desires that go beyond our needs. But God tells us he is not going to bestow less care for his image bearers, which we are, than he does for the creation that does not bear his image. We do not have to be anxious. The activities of this world are not just happening randomly by chance. God is actively working in creation for the sake of Christ by his word and spirit. He actively works now by his word and spirit. And I believe it was Michael Horton, just to pin it down a little bit further, who said that God's word and creation and then providence works something like your spouse telling you that they love you. And think about perhaps the first time your spouse told you that they loved you. In saying those words, your spouse created something with their speech. Those words, first off, put into existence the truth that you were loved by your future spouse. That truth was not something that was not known before. That is a new creation. I now know I am loved. Now it is known. Now it is real. You now know you're loved. But those words, that word, also created something in you. They have an effect on you that grows and causes you to act in different ways. You began to put more importance in the things you said and did towards your future spouse. I'm sure you had already adjusted your life to some degree uh, towards them, but now once they said, I loved you, I love you, they, you changed even more. Uh, you changed more things. You changed more parts of your schedule. As we say, things got more serious. It's not um, a great analogy. It's a weak analogy. But I think you can see the truth there. God's word created this existence, but it also continues to have a providential effect on all things as we come to understand and know in Christ that we are loved. We were created. We were made into children and we are loved, and it continues to grow within us. The answer to Heidelberg Catechism 27 states that God upholds and governs, 
so that herbs and grass, rain and drought, fruitful and barren years, meat and drink, health and sickness, riches and poverty, all things come from God. They come from this original word of creation that continues to affect seed time and harvest. But that word also continues to speak to us and to bring all things that come to pass for our good, but primarily for his glory. The creation itself groans as God works with love in the midst of a fallen world. The creation waits with eager longing. It tells us in Romans for the revealing of the sons of God, for the redemption of our bodies. God is at work in the midst of a fallen world, upholding, directing, disposing, governing to cause those who are his to seek him and to come to him for salvation, for their sanctification, for his glory. And then the end will come. But until the end, we declare that God reigns and that he preserves and that he provides. Psalm 104 is another great psalm describing creation and then God's providence in his creation. The first nine verses speak to creation and then verses 10 and following uh, speak to God's works, his providence. Let's just turn there. I'm not too far away. Psalm 104. Again, you have nine verses really speaking to the creation. And then in verse 10, it begins... Speaking of God, you make springs gush forth in the valleys. They flow between the hills. They give drink to every beast of the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. Beside them, the birds of the heavens dwell. They sing among the branches. From your lofty abode, water, you water the mountains. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of your work. You cause the grass to grow for the livestock and plants for man to cultivate that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine to gladden the heart of man, oil to make his face shine and bread to strengthen man's heart. The trees of the Lord are watered abundantly, the cedars of Lebanon that he planted. In them the birds build their nests, the stork has her home in the fir trees. The high mountains are for the wild goats, the rocks are a refuge for the rock badgers. He made the moon to mark the seasons. The sun knows it's time for setting. You make darkness and it is night when all the beasts of the forest creep about. The young lions roar for their prey, seeking their food from God. When the sun rises, they steal away and lie down in their dens. Man goes out to his work and to his labor unto the evening. O oh Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom, you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. And the chapter goes on. God is active in his creation now. And what we are simply stating is that our father who has created has not left us to fend for ourselves, but continues to act for our good and his glory. Hopefully some of you have thought of other verses. You're thinking, why, why didn't Todd use this verse or that verse? Um, Hebrews chapter one, verse three, where we read, and I think we used this verse even last week or the week before, where we read that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is the radiance of the glory of God. He's the exact imprint of his nature. And then Hebrews one, three states that he, Christ, upholds the universe by the word of his power. It's providence. Or maybe Proverbs chapter 16, verse nine, the heart of man plans his ways, but the Lord establishes his steps. In these verses, we see that our God upholds. We make plans, but God governs. There are many other verses, many chapters. Psalm 2, God governs the nations. Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 6, God has created the heavens and the earth, and he preserves it all. There really is no question if we believe the Bible that God has created and he continues to be in total control. 
The real issue that people have is what they then, they then don't know what to do with their so-called free will. This isn't a message on the will, so let's stick with the truth that we can say you do make choices and you make free choices according to your nature. That is biblical truth. But in those free choices you make, there is a providence of God behind them. There is a good God working out his purposes. Theologians call what happens between God's sovereignty and our choices concurrence or concursus. Concurrence comes from the Latin term concurro, which means to run with or runs with. The meaning being that divine providence and our actions run with each other in some way, shape, or form. We won't solve this mystery of this morning, but as one theologian wrote, it is like the case that God does not literally move birds in their migration, and yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the Father. Matthew 10, 29. The more logical explanation here is that God is the primary cause of the movement of the birds. He's the primary cause of an infinite, literally an infinite number of things that are happening every nanosecond that those birds exist. And yet there are secondary causes, including the will, if you can say it that way, of those birds where they choose to move or not move every nanosecond of their existence. And yet, not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the Father. Which brings us back, for me, to the reason why we discuss providence at all. Not because we are going to completely understand it, or I could completely help you to understand it this morning, but because we, we need to simply know that it's true. You've read it in God's word this morning. And how knowing that it is our Father, our good and gracious and merciful and loving Father, is the one that is acting out His divine providence. And knowing how that should affect us if we know that it is He that is the one that is directing all things. Which is our second point, which is what we find in the answer to question 28. Knowing that God is divinely working in all of creation, that God is upholding and governing even in this fallen world, it gives us at least three advantages, as the Heidelberg Catechism calls them. What are they? They're in the answer. We can be patient in adversity. We can be thankful in prosperity. And in anything that befalls us, we can be fully trustful that nothing is going to separate us from the love of God. We can start with a familiar verse. I hope it's becoming a familiar verse for you, Romans 8, 28, that we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. And that's the understanding that we need to start with. The Heidelberg Catechism is written, Romans chapter eight, verse 28, points out the truth that the promises that we are talking about, the advantages even that we are speaking of right now are for his children. They are for his people. They are not for everyone. There, there are too many that you will run into that will treat scripture like every promise in the Bible for every person that has ever existed. The truth is God makes promises for God's covenant people. That's where the promises are found in covenant with him for those in Christ as the New Testament so often writes and declares it that way. These promises are not for those outside of a saving union with Christ. And so we emphasize here that the advantages listed are not for everyone. Not to be mean, but to point people towards the God who can make them true for them. Patience, Thankfulness, trust in God can be artificially fabricated, but they only find their true anchor in a saving relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ. And once repentance and belief are yours, then you can have patience in adversity. Romans chapter five tells us that we can rejoice 
in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame. Why? Because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. Do you believe that? God works through our suffering so that we will continually turn to him. Turning to God creates endurance. That endurance creates a character that will show forth that we are a person that continually turns to God even in our suffering. And God will never fail to provide what you need. Not what you want, but what you need. That is his providence, providing what you need, not what you want, for his children. And you will see this, and you will have hope. You'll be encouraged. Your hope will be increased. And this will never be put to shame because God has poured himself and his spirit into you to use you to glorify him through suffering, endurance, Hope, character. First Peter chapter four, verse 19. Peter writes, therefore let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Things might not look good. They might look bad in a worldly sense, often for us. Things do not look well for many Christians in the Ukraine at this time. And it might not even make sense for us, for them spiritually. Why is this happening? But we know that good is going to come. So we trust. We trust our soul to God and we keep doing good. We keep following the commands of God as 1 Peter 4, 19 tells us because he's a good God and he's working out his purpose to glorify Christ and good will come for us. We could ask Job, go ask Job, right? We know the calamities that fell upon Job, the death of his livelihood, the death of his family, those closest to him. It's hard to imagine a worse situation than what Job found himself under, especially with the blessings that he already had. And Job lived out the words that Peter would write centuries later when Job said, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. Do we truly live like this? That's an understanding of providence. Do we have that understanding? We should. This is God's creation for him, not for me. This is for his glory, not for my glory. And ultimately, the Lord is going to do good for our soul. And so we should entrust our souls to his good care. Maybe more dangerously for us than understanding our position and our patience and suffering We need to make sure that we're being thankful in prosperity. That's the situation that most of us find ourselves in. All the way back in Deuteronomy chapter eight, verse 10, back with Moses, God tells his people, when you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Do we do that? The same principle holds for us today. Have you thanked the Lord for what he has given you? Providence tells us that you didn't get that on your own, but that's so often what we think. Providence tells us everything we have is a gift from God. You would have, you would have nothing if God had decided to direct or dispose or to govern the things that you have in some other direction to some other person. Do you have a nice job? Thank God for it. You could lose it tomorrow. All it takes is one person, 
not even telling the truth. You don't have to sin. Someone can bear false witness against you one time and you could be out of your current vocation. And all you worked for, all you obtained is you will cry out whenever you're losing your job. All that you obtained would be lost. Providence says you never obtained it in the first place. And you could be back looking for a minimum wage job. Be patient, be thankful. It's God's providence. And this is not a threat. God doesn't tell us these things and I'm not telling these things to you as a threat. God's not saying, if you don't thank me, I'm gonna cause you to lose your job. It's not a threat, it's a warning for you to examine yourself. And the warning is simply this. If you are not thankful to God for what you have, is that not a sign that you really have not understood who God is to begin with? and where all the good things that you have came from. And you're still depending and relying upon yourself and not God. To come to faith is to understand that God truly is sovereign in all things that you have. Understanding that God is almighty and that every good thing comes from his hand is a part of understanding and coming to believe in the one true benevolent and merciful Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so understanding divine providence, God's governance of this world makes us servants, patient in adversity, thankful in times of prosperity, knowing that prosperity, we don't think about this either, that prosperity can be as long or as brief as that suffering that we have found ourselves in. Both are for God's glory and for my sanctification. Not because God owes me anything, but because he loves me and he wants me to be conformed to the image of his son and he uses suffering and prosperity for them both. How he needs for you. Therefore, we ought to be trusting firmly in any situation. This is the third advantage. Trusting firmly in any situation that we Cannot. Prosperity or suffering are not the thing that separate us from God's love. If I am truly his and he is truly mine, then nothing can separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's Romans 8, 39. And then Psalm 55 verse 22 states, cast your cares on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous fall. And in the end, I believe more than anything, this is why we even begin to need to know about divine providence and scratch the surface of how God's sovereignty and our free actions or choices work simultaneously somehow in concurrence. It can be a nice logical exercise to reach, to find out how they somehow coexist. But the true reason for us to know that God is sovereign sovereign, and providentially upholding and governing everything is so that we as his people can be comforted because that is the most comforting fact you can know if you truly trust in him. And logically, I would offer that we ask those that would reject divine providence or place our choices above God's sovereignty, what kind of world are they living in? What kind of world do they think they have without God upholding and governing everything that happens in this world? Life is a chaotic mess where there is no comfort if God is not directing and disposing and governing all that comes to pass. It is a nightmare if God is not in control. There could be no patience in suffering and no thankfulness in prosperity because it would be because of me. It would be because of us. My suffering would have no purpose if it was just the result of other wicked men with nothing good promised, nothing good 
to be produced by the suffering that I am going under. Prosperity would be just as random and not a provision of a good God. It would all truly be meaningless and just a random set of events and activities in this world that just happened until we die and then the judgment. But the truth is, God is working out his purposes to glorify himself. That's what providence is truly about, God glorifying himself. And then our our sanctification by God's grace comes along with that. And so we can be patient and thankful and trusting in our good father. God's providence declares that everywhere, everywhere, because God created everywhere where there is an everywhere. I hope that made sense. Everywhere, the almighty power of God, as it were, by his hand, is upholding and governing heaven, earth, and all creatures. There is no existence without him. There are no what about this is or what about that's. God is in control for his glory. Concurrently, we make choices according to our nature. And what do they do? They bring about sin in this world. And in our salvation, God works so that we then sin less and less and follow him more and more. But sin is still produced in this fallen creation by other fallen creatures still in their fallen state. But we can be patient and we can be thankful and we can be trusting knowing that God is providentially working out his good purpose for each of his children. Even in places like the Ukraine right now or Canada or Wyoming or Western Nebraska. We must praise God in our suffering, in our prosperity, be thankful in all things, trusting. From Job to Jesus himself, things have looked grim unto death, but God has brought out his good purpose in every situation by his fatherly hand. And if we will stop, if we will stop our struggle to make our own way in this world, we will be able to see our Father at work for our good and his glory because of his providence. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do again thank you for condescending to speak to us in your word that we might have some understanding of what you are doing, how you are doing it, but more importantly, so that we might find comfort in the fact that you are our sovereign God, that you have a purpose to save your people, to sanctify us, and for us to trust, for us to believe, for us to have our hope in what you are doing and not what we can do in this life. Help us to be faithful. Help us to be obedient. Help us just to continue by your word and spirit to follow all that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has commanded. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Take your hymnal. Stand with me if you are able. And we will sing of the tender love a father has. Hymn 93. Thank you.
Amen. Hear the blessing of our God. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen. Amen.